that is happening. All right. So first, I'll just provide background on the excellent uh, lineup of speakers we have today. Uh, King us off will be Jim Younger, the principal of uh, Climate Action Associates. Jim is a uh, forward thinker and a leader in local government climate and sustainability with 20 years experience in climate science, local energy policy, and software technology. Uh, he has a knack for standing back from individual problems, finding systemic root causes, and creating solutions that scale to standards. In clean energy communities, Jim assists municipalities in the eastern New York region with their projects after they receive clean energy community designations. He's available to guide communities through the grant process for suggestions and any assistance necessary to keep the process from application completion to project submit track and yeah. We have Mayor Gregory Martin with us from the village of Champlain. He is a retired educator who spent 32 years teaching and is uh, now retired since 2009. He became involved with village government when he watched a village board meeting and became very concerned with the elected officials representing the residents there. After six years as a trustee, uh, Greg was appointed mayor and has held the position for the last seven years. He'll be by uh, Mark Domenico, a registered architect and the chief code enforcement officer and building inspector for the city of Rome. The Code Enforcement Office is responsible for enforcement of building codes, zoning codes, and the issuance of building permits and their required inspection. The City of Rome Common Council has adopted the New York State Uniform Air Prevention and Building Code for the administration and enforcement of all construction and maintenance of new and existing properties. Finally, we'll hear from Lindsay Auden, uh, Committee in uh, Westchester County. Uh, Lindsay, 40 years in energy services, including eight years as an energy manager for Columbia University. His energy consulting firm holds uh, serve large commercial, institutional, and industrial customers, as well as other consultants. He holds certifications in energy management and procurement and is a lead accredited professional. For his work, he's received many national and international awards, including membership in the Energy Managers Hall of Fame. His book, Lower Facilities Electric Rates, was published last September by the Association of Energy Engineers. Welcome, everybody. So we're going to get started with Jim. There we go. Over to you, Jim. Great, you, Pat. So again, uh, my name is Jinger of Climate Action Associates. We are a contractor to the Capital District Regional Planning Commission. And one of our roles is to provide technical support to help communities think through and develop great projects that can fund with uh, incentive support to, uh, achieved or awarded through this program. In addition today, because we haven't been involved in a number of different projects, we are going to um, talk about the kinds of projects that, that you can fund through this program. For those who don't know about the Clean Energy Communities Program, it is a program sponsored by NACE. Please go back. Please. A little bit. Those of you who are not aware of the yeah. Clean Energy Community Program, it sounds like you have a lag on the slides. Uh, okay. okay. I'm hearing you uh, all that well. Okay. So, start. So, for those of you who are not aware of the Clean Energy Community Program, is a NYSERDA sponsored program available to all municipalities and counties uh, to reward energy leadership. There's two basic steps. First, you become a dedicated clean energy coordinator by completing at least four out of 10 high impact policy actions intended to help your community become more sustainable. And then on the next slide, you can learn a lot more about these actions by speaking with your clean energy community coordinator. Step number two, when you receive designation, uh, you will be eligible for potentially funding up to $250,000 with no share based on a number of factors, including size and how fast you move through the program. Uh, please. Invested to deploy a series of clean energy community, community coordinators around the state based in regional organizations uh, are intended to uh, help you uh, on the ground 
through all aspects of the program. You'll see on this slide that the four RDC regions are really affiliated in a, an umbrella group we call the Eastern Territory, and the cores are managed by a contract with NYSERDA held by the Capital District Regional Planning Commission. The four contracts that you see here are your clean energy lead clean energy community coordinators. Uh, these four individuals will be happy to come and visit your community, speak to your elected officials, your staff, and your community members, generally help you uh, and handhold you through um, all aspects of the program. And in cases, some of our more assertive orders may, may take you across the finish line you know, screaming, but we found even some communities appreciate that level of, of uh, deep technical support. Uh, next next uh, slide, please. Under the Clean Energy Community Program, there's funding available and allocated to each REDC on a first-come, first-served basis. The funding is arranged in three blocks. Uh, one is between $100,000 and $250,000 based on your size. There are six of these awards available, and the first six designated communities are eligible to get those awards. The next block is smaller, uh, from 50 to 100,000, 150,000, and again, it's for a set of communities that achieve designation. And the, the good news is that NYSERDA has recently added a block three, uh, which adds a smaller incentive, but much more of them, so that additional funding available to communities that may have missed the block one or two awards. And we note that if you are a resident or a community uh, in Albany, Rensselaer, Columbia, and Greene County, you may have an additional $30,000 available to you due to a settlement agreement between Lafarge Corporation and the Attorney General's Office. Next slide, please. This first come, first serve basis. So we urge you to visit the Clean Energy Community Coordinators, uh, Clean Energy Communities website. There's a tool there where you can check out the status of available funding because one community becomes designated and pass, passes that fourth high impact action, one of the grants will be allocated to it and it will no longer be available to other communities. These screenshots are from that website, and I took them two weeks ago, actually, when I started preparing this presentation, and, and the available funding changes day, day to day, so I encourage communities to go there and check out what funding is currently available as of today. As of weeks ago, you can see on this slide, there was a fair amount of uh, Block 1 and 2 grants still available in the Mohawk Valley and in the North Country. In the middle re region, there was a small amount of Block 2 grants left, all the large Block 1 grants have been taken. And finally, in the Mid-Hudson region, all of the Block 1 and 2 grants have already been claimed. However, the news is that with the addition of the Block 3 funding, there is still an ample supply of incentives available to communities across the entire Eastern Territory. Next slide, please. To become designated, it's time for thinking about uh, what kind of project you want to fund. To pass, once the fourth high impact action is certified, NERDA will send you a letter congratulating you on being designated. The letter will also indicate in what incentive is available to you based on, on the block of funding you may have been eligible for. Um, and at that point, it's time to think about how to get a project going. Some communities may enter this project with a pro you know, enter the clean energy communities program with a project they already want to fund. And for them, it's very simple. They can move directly to developing an application and uh, submit their materials to to fully get their funding. Cities may enter this and not may receive designation and not know what they want to fund. So NYSERDA provides a three month window for you to develop and submit your application. And for you who don't know what you want to fund, three we found is added through a brainstorming period to select a project. To, uh, and then finally proceed to develop application materials for it. Now, we emphasize in this, NYSERDA is very willing and very flexible to help you get a great project. The coordinators want to help you get a great project. We'll help you brainstorm ideas. Cleanliness is important. You've been given, you'll be given three months, and you should expect to, you should complete your application within those three months, or you should request a one-time ex time extension. Um, these, are, this is the 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 area that NYSERDA really wants to keep everyone on track. That everyone is is timely in their submissions. Um, to actually make a submission, there's a couple documents. You'll have to develop a project application form and a statement of work. 
which is a model contract that you will eventually execute with NYSERDA. These aren't too difficult to produce. You'll start working on them, you know, in the run-up to preparing uh, your submission. And um, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that shortly. Uh, next slide, please. So talk about getting a good project. And the great thing about this uh, funding source, as, as I said before, there is no match. And you can be very creative about how you um, look at the projects you fund. There aren't any technical requirements for the projects. There are just criteria. And this is a, a great way for you to fund projects that you maybe you haven't thought of before or, or to uh, pursue something innovative. Uh, no, I believe. So what we're looking for here is not specific technical projects, even though I'm going to talk about some common ones soon, but looking really for quality of projects that will meet certain criteria. The program is funded with a greenhouse gas mitigation uh, line item in the budget. So projects that you propose, it's important that they have greenhouse gas and energy uh, savings or renewables benefits. Um, that is really top priority. The most important criteria for a project and is really a practical one. It has to be well-defined, feasible, and tangible. So this means uh, it just be a good idea, even if it's an awesome idea, you have to be able to demonstrate to NYSERDA that you, you have the willingness to, to move forward, that the partners are in place. There is a, is a concrete timeline, and there are very, very few to no barriers for, for moving forward. This is important to NYSERDA. They have had experience over the years of very project ideas only were found to not be thought through enough. And there were barriers that cropped up that probably should have been figured out in advance that ultimately came up later and move, and prevented projects from moving forward. And ultimately, next has funding that it is not spending in communities getting projects and, and no one wins in that case. So it's important to take the three months to come up with a project that is, is absolutely doable. The other criteria here, um, again, what we're to happy, if your projects have these criteria, you don't have to have all, all of them. But if the project you pick is replicable across different municipalities, my sort will always appreciate that to see your good ideas being expanded and, and spread across the state. Um, if you for projects that have innovative components that are solving problems in new ways, you can uh, NYSERDA research and development authority. So by nature, they, they appreciate forward thinking and, and new ideas, and as long as they're practical and feasible but have innovative components, that's always great. And finally, your projects, it's great if they have economic benefits with good return investments, they'll save you money, possibly leverage external, either your government or private investment, and or jobs or other economic features. Next slide, please. So on a series of common projects now that we've seen come through this program, they're all great projects and all probably a project that each of you listening could implement in your own municipality. The first kind of project we see coming through are capital projects, the things like water and wastewater system upgrades, and we're going to hear a, 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 one of these projects from a speaker today. Variable speed drives and wastewater systems are dissolved oxygen controls. Um, they would be larger infrastructure uh, investments like investments in combined heat and power or whole systems and building upgrades for energy efficiency, HVAC systems, insulation, et cetera. These kinds of projects are generally large amount of funding that you would have available. And so they typically may integrate with an existing project you have in a capital plan. So you can peruse your capital plan. If you find something that will match uh, NYSERDA and we can help you integrate CEC funding to improve that project or expand it in some way. So this is very common. We've seen these projects. Next slide, please. A project area that we number of is facility-wide LED lighting upgrades. And municipalities that persist will typically leverage a utility incentive that's available to offset the cost of each of the fixtures. And from two options most municipalities will take. One is a turnkey approach in which they hire a utility designated contractor to do a full uh, design, furnish, and install project um, on a turnkey basis. And that way, in that approach, the community will get a free energy or lighting audit and proposal from the contractor. 
contractor. The contractor will line item what the utility incentive is and what the municipal responsibility is. And at that point, the municipality can apply its CEC funds to its municipal share. And take communities that do this will go through the lighting audit during the three months uh, of design phase and submit as part of the project application the design proposal with the line item cost they expect to cover with the CEC funds. These projects have been, are, are typically very attractive. You find paybacks on total project cost of five to eight years, which is, which is pretty good and not uncommon for LED lighting. The approach that we've seen communities take is self-implement these projects. It is possible if your municipality has experience in lighting to go and do your own lighting audit and select fixtures for replacement um, based on lists of fixtures available from utilities that have rebates to go ahead and purchase them, install them, and then apply CEC funding to the materials costs for the supplies that you're, for the fixtures you're buying. In this case, naturally, your dollar is going to go a lot longer and your payback periods are going to be much better. But again, the trade-off is you have to go through and do the work to do it. So in both cases, these are viable and both attractive projects. Next slide, please. A project that is growing is, is municipalities are using their CEC funds to buy electric vehicles and charging equipment. Uh, this is ramping up because electric vehicles are now on state contract, and there's gen generally a much higher awareness of them than there was in the prior years. Uh, and so, so typically, funds, uh, fully or, or hybrid sedans may be in in the range of five to thirty-five thousand dollars a piece, after other incentives have been applied, like rebates from from DEC, uh, a lot of communities that are considering this are looking at applying them in code enforcement. That's the most common application. These are this is a great application because these are short cycle vehicles traveling and we really ending up each day at the same exact place. So a municipality can put charging in home base and charge the vehicles each night. We've seen our municipalities applying this or counties for career vehicles and other sort of administrative vehicles. We've had uh, one county apply for uh, to purchase electric vehicles for school resource officers deployed out of the sheriff's department. So again, there's a number of different viable options for this. Um, next slide, please. That communities are considering is converting public street lighting within the community to LEDs. So this has been an option people are, have been aware of for the last year or two. Public Service Commission acted to enable this. But for the first year and a half of this, it was very it was very difficult to do it because the utilities did not have adequate rules in place or tariffs to describe how this would work. But really, things are changing. The Public Service Commission is approving utility tariffs that have, have more clear pathways to convert your streetlights to LEDs, and this provides opportunities for you to invest your CEC funding this. Your options are you can continue to have the utilities own and operate your streetlights through a utility LED tariff, or you can possibly buy them back from the utility and own and operate and manage them yourself. So in both of those cases, there will be something called a stranded cost where you compensate a utility for the uh, cost of the existing equipment that is going to be retired prematurely. Um, and there's different pathways to move forward, whether you want to own and operate it or whether you want the utility to keep it. But in either case, there's a number of ways you could apply CEC funds in this. Um, whether you want to spend money on designing consulting services to assist you in the transition to LEDs or to pay for direct costs, such as stranded costs or new figures, there's other possible models too. Some communities are looking at full service uh, versions using NICA or third party uh, companies to do a, a turnkey design, furnish, install, finance, and manage approach. Um, and those approaches typically have no cost down to a municipality. But even in that case, you could apply CEC funds to break down the overall cost of the project and probably reduce your monthly LA. So you have to, we have to be a little creative in figuring out how to put your CEC funding into this because there's many ways to proceed, but it's absolutely possible. Please. Another type of project that is viable and uh, commonly pursued is variety of renewable energy applications. There's always the typical 
typical rooftop and ground mount solar applications at facilities and wastewater treatment plants that can continue to be pursued with CEC funding. Uh, there's also recently a, an increased interest in a growth of something called community distributed generation, which really is large scale solar farms. Some communities have been putting these on landfills, but recently the Public Service Commission is enabling these to be developed in a number of locations and enabling developers to sell uh, uh, the elements of the solar um, to third parties, whether it's residents or municipalities. So you consider investing your CEC funds to participate in a community distributed generation operation to help offset your own consumption with complete renewable energy, or you could potentially partner the developer, the location, uh, and then create a business model where you help deploy um, some sort of community distributed generation, which may be offered to your residents or, or other ways. Again, there's a number of business models available that you could explore using your CEC funding for. Um, finally, another interesting renewable energy op option that's coming up is ground source heat. Every, this has existed for a long time. It is recognized in New York's energy plan as an important component, and NERDA has been investing a lot of time recently. Uh, think about ways to make it cheaper and to create incentives for doing it. Um, a typical barrier for this is that it's just expensive up front. If you're digging up a, a big chunk of your property near a facility for piping, and it's just a hard cost to justify up front. But really, CEC funding is in the range of a cost for a system like this for a typical facility size. So if you have a facility with appropriate land characteristics and, and extent may be viable, and through this program, either we or we can connect you with NYSERDA experts to help you evaluate these options as well. So slide, please. This up. You don't necessarily have to focus solely on projects that you may own or operate in your, in your operations. In fact, NYSERDA is very flexible. You can consider investing in community-focused projects as well. Some examples that we've seen coming through this project. We've had community invest in a nonprofit to uh, provide an electric vehicle to its Meals on Wheels program uh, simply to help the program out. That community felt that there were many residents in its community that rely on Meals on Wheels, and they felt that it was a worthwhile investment to help that program along and help it become more sustainable. We have community look at partnering with its school district to introduce organics recycling in its school district in which dedicate its CEC funding to purchase in-vessel compost units to help the school district uh, use uh, waste and to become more sustainable. This is a good option. It's going to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and help reduce landfills in the state of New York. We need to look at investing at this in setting up community choice aggregation and all interesting programs like pass-through incentives where a community getting this grant may end up passing it through to either residents or in the case of a county or municipalities to help do energy work and necessarily keep the money themselves. And finally, we had another community Stop their CEC funding, some of it on LED lighting, a typical project, and, and divert half of it to developing a smart growth plan. Um, and they were able to come together and uh, develop a project that had the short term benefits of the LED lighting and then long term transformational benefits of the plant piece. And last one I can say NICE is interested in very tangible greenhouse gas but it is possible to break up your funding and fund some pieces like this planning piece that have longer benefits if you're cleaning it with a project that is tangible and are going to produce near-term benefits. So again, it's a matter of creativity um, and figuring out how best to spend your funds. So slide, please, and last slide. Uh, you can, through this time, you can get free project development support from your clean energy coordinator team. Uh, Action Associates is one of the members that, that provides this. We can assist you in leading your project brainstorming sessions and generally connecting the dots on all the options that you have. Uh, we can facilitate meetings with your stakeholders. And in between, if you're thinking of different options, we can assist in vetting project ideas or pre-quotes and generally trying to figure out if the idea is feasible before you make the submission. At the day, we can assist in developing your project application materials and making sure that you get them in on time and in in, in format with the hope that we all everyone to uh, get a good project in, in the end. So with that, I'm going to pass it back to you and uh, the other speakers tell you about the great projects going on in New York.
out. Thank you for that very comprehensive uh, overview. That was terrific. Samir Martin, I'm going to unmute you, or maybe you have to unmute you. Looks like I've already done it. In a moment, from Mayor Greg Martin of the Village of Champlain. It shows your phone. Uh, with your side. Okay. You want to um, try turning off, Greg? Well, let could do, perhaps, while we're working on that, with uh, Greg, who was just talking to us before <laughs> we began today, uh, is we could move over to uh, Mark Domenico. But let's give it another moment here. Greg, if you want to, uh, me, you have my number, and we can figure out, out what's going on. There you are. Hi, Greg. Yeah. Okay, we have you. Welcome. Can you, Greg? Where is this person's number? Oh, we're unmuted. I hear you. You said I was muted. No, good. You're good. good. How did you? I didn't. I didn't touch it. I talked to her. Yeah. Yeah. Where's your number? I'm gonna I'm gonna mute Greg while he works on that. Uh, and I another second here. Here. Greg, you're up. We do. You hear me? So, do I need to disconnect and recall? Uh, no, we hear you guys fine. So, Greg can just get started. Okay. Yep, we're good. Okay. You you don't have visual? Okay. It was fine. Yeah. Okay. I can hear him. Uh, we sure can. I can hear you just fine. I can't hear Greg. Okay. Wherever you are is what I, I got the slides back up. Oh, excellent. All right. Well, welcome. Thank you. Can I just begin? Yeah, absolutely. Tell us what's going on in Champlain. All right. Uh, first, I'd like to say thank you, Jim. That was a wonderful presentation, and I encourage everyone out there uh, that involved in this webinar to, to use services. He's he's a fantastic person, and I'll relate more to that in just a moment. I'd say good morning and greet all of you. Uh, from the northernmost part of New York State, uh, we are currently under a state of emergency as we are awaiting the ice flow out of the Great Cheesy River. Uh, we are moving forward, and we will get through this as we do every spring. Uh, a number ago, about seven years ago, or so, the Village of Champlain began a project to replace two aging, non-energy efficient blowers at our wastewater facility. We followed procedure, we requested proposals from various blower manufacturers, and received bids from two suppliers. Board, when the bid felt the quote were very high, and the village's ability to afford such a project at that time. Now, here with 2018, and we are now prepared to move forward on this on the replacement of these two outdated blowers. For the first attempt, we were able to put money in a reserve account to a large debt placed upon our wastewater users, maintain the rates, and essentially lucked out as the existing blowers continued functioning until recently, when one of the blowers had a stir problem. I did immediate attention, only to find out that uh, replacement parts were almost impossible to find. Our DPW superintendent was able to find a workable 
motor that's still functioning, but for how long? His guests. The different project showed that there, did, there was an apparent immediate need to move forward and complete this project as soon as possible. The urging and guidance of Jamie Rogers and Nancy Bernstein of the Adirondack North Country Association, the village began the process of going through the clean energy communities process. They, uh, they were very helpful. I encourage everyone to use these resources. We completed four of the ten benchmarks uh, to be appointed as a clean energy community. Uh, one of the most exciting things, at least for our huge, is that we have two EV charging stations down at the village playground, which is for anyone to use to come in and charge their electric vehicle. Both Jamie and Nancy were very supportive and knowledgeable while helping the village stay focused and moving forward throughout this process. Jim of Climate Actions Associates became involved with our project and was extremely instrumental in our being able to submit our application complete and our time. Without the help and guidance of these individuals, this process would certainly have more daunting and more time consuming for our small village. Uh, next slide, please. This shows the this shows the the vintage of our current wastewater blowers and how energy inefficient our present system has been. We alternate to two blowers on a weekly basis and perform maintenance on a regular schedule. No variable controls. The demands on starting are very high and obviously very costly. The current estimate is that about 60% of our energy costs contributed to antiquated blowers. Last month's wastewater energy bill, because of high demand throughout New York State, our energy bill, wastewater plant, doubled. With approximately $2,100 to a little over 4000 for the last month. Next, please. The firm, Barton Lutus, DPC, who's been working on this proposal and developed the information presented on these slides, gave a 2017 update on the anticipated changes to the blower system and the potential savings we would realize over the coming years. The blower configuration will be employed as space in the existing building would not allow the three blowers. This shows that by changing over our existing blower system to a more energy efficient arrangement, the potential is estimated at 36%. The new system will not only reduce our energy use from 241,000 kilowatts to 150 kilowatt hours with current flow conditions. This will also reduce our GHG emissions by 27.6, which is so significant environmentally. Our next is to start on the, of the, on the bottom of the slide is to get the new fit in our building without a lot of new construction and remodeling. At our wastewater plant, we recently had an energy audit completed in conjunction with NYSEG and had the entire lighting system changed over to the fixtures and lights, and this should also help reduce electric consumption in the near future. This is one of the programs that Jim spoke of in the presentation. In conclusion, the bill determined that this upgrade, though expensive, is necessary for the continued functioning of our wastewater mandate. This service is not only for our village residents, approximately 1,100 residents here in the village of Champlain, being, but also that a big number of users in the town of Champlain and the border crossing with Quebec, as well a number of businesses located within the village and in the town. An efficient wastewater treatment facility providing this necessary public utility, a large section of northern New York State, 
would ultimately be adversely affected. The goal is to provide this service at a reasonable rate for our users and responsible environmental partner. We feel necessary to get this project started as soon as possible. Using funds we've held in reserve in addition to investing $50,000 grant from NYSERDA to two aging blower motors at our wastewater plant. Village amendments or estimates that the overall capital cost of the wastewater treatment plant or upgrade project is about $300,000. Added to providing funds in addition to the CEC grant as required to complete it. The energy community of this project in cooperation with NYSERDA will demonstrate to other communities the importance of obtaining the CE designation. The grant to provide new energy efficient blowers with increased capacity will prove important in our quest to revitalize our community, explore the possibilities of economic growth, and provide this important service to our users at a reasonable rate while reading our energy footprint. Extremely changed over to a uh, different uh, energy supplier, Constant Municipal Energy, which is uh, through county. Uh, county has switched over. Uh, we have switched over, and the town of Saranac has switched over. And we should be able to receive electricity at a lesser rate at this with, uh, with use. And as mentioned before, we had an independent uh, facility LED lighting project where a contract come in looked at that uh, as an estimate. It showed our savings would be significant. So the village board went ahead with part of this, and we will continue to move forward. Um, that's all I have, Pat. Thank you. Gosh, that was terrific, Mayor Martin. I really appreciate it. Um, you've given inspiration to a lot of communities that have wastewater treatment issues. So thank you so much for pulling that report together. Thank you. I appreciate your help. Absolutely. I'm going to mute you. We'll go over to uh, Mark Domenico. Mark, are you there? I am. All right, hold on. There we go. You know by saying next when you want me to uh, proceed. Okay. Uh, you, uh, the, the city of Rome um, is located approximately 40 miles uh, to the east of Syracuse. Uh, the city is a, is a very, very large footprint. It's approximately 76 square miles in territory, and uh, we're made up of an urban core uh, that is uh, industrial and primarily residential, and it's, it's, the perimeter is, is surrounded by a, a, a rural area made up of, uh, of farms and, and family homes. Uh, the coach department uh, is currently staffed with, with uh, three full building inspectors and four full-time housing inspectors, and they are responsible for the coverage of the entire the entire territory. Uh, fortunate, uh, we are in the Mohawk Valley region. We we were fortunate to have uh, Dan Sullivan as our clean energy community coordinator. Uh, Dan uh, approached uh, me about uh, about a year ago, and uh, was talking about this program. And uh, he was inter instrumental uh, in sitting with us and, and helping us through. Next, uh, the, uh, we, we were pleasantly surprised when we looked at the, um, the 10 high impact areas. Uh, we were pleasantly surprised that the city of Rome over the past decade has been pretty forward thinking with respect to um, energy conservation uh, and making the investments uh, in, in clean energy. They, the prior to being made aware of, of this, this program, the city partnered with the developer uh, for solar array on a, on a uh, old landfill. And they also invested in solar uh, panels on City Hall to provide uh, power to, to facility. Um, we looked at the, uh, at the 10. Uh, we, have, uh, we already had completed two of them, um, the provide solar permit, uh, being uh, the director of the code enforcement office, that was an excellent uh, move uh, to to uh, have that be, be provided for adoption by towns, villages, and cities. 
uh, to really streamline and homogenize the process as far as what is required for building permit application. Uh, it it, it, there's, there was a, a, lot, a little bit of confusion out of the gate with this, and some of the, uh, the installers and developers were getting uh, some mixed messages from the, from the code enforcement community, and this really made it a standardized application that was statewide. That was that was excellent. It's an, if for you listening, uh, you know, you if your code enforcement office and your municipality has not adopted unified solar permit, um, I would strongly advise you do it. Uh, you will see that it would streamline and make these installations um, uh, go a lot smoother in your community. This we did that we was the uh, installation of electric charging stations. They were already installed at our home base uh, where, where the code enforcement uh, office is located. We have 10 of them uh, located throughout the city uh, in, at municipal sites. Um, we have the vehicles uh, to, uh, to utilize them, but the infrastructure was in. And the two that we looked at to, uh, to actually go and, and to, to adopt was the sparking. We passed a uh, legislation uh, and we worked with our tax office and with our um, uh, public works department to get that process in place for energy benchmarking uh, and, and develop a policy for that. And the, the last one we did was the uh, energy code enforcement training uh, through TY Lynn. And um, that was very, very interesting. And, and uh, once we, once we uh, at all four of those, we did uh, make application and we did receive a one award of $100,000. Uh, that was in the uh, uh, fall last year. Next, I'd like to drill a little bit down into the uh, energy uh, code enforcement training and just kind of share the experience that we had. Basic requirements for that component of it was that we had to select two projects that were probably uh, in the process of being constructed. And we would submit to TY Lynn the contract documents for those that were submitted to our office. We would review those documents for, for compliance with the energy code. We selected a, uh, a convenience store that was uh, under construction, about, uh, it was about a 3,000 square foot convenience store. And we also selected a fit out of, uh, of a relatively newly constructed building of a, of a tenant space, about 10,000 square feet. So uh, what would typically happen is they would make the plan review, they'd give you your plan review comments back uh, to, to show you kind of where some of the deficiencies were, and they would come on site with you uh, to review the results of that and then dispatch to the actual locations to do an in-field in um, uh, inspection of the components and 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 to have some discussion with respect to that. We it would be a great idea to fold in the design professionals as well uh, to the process. Uh, so we contacted the uh, two design professionals that were responsible for the creation of the contract documents, and we basically provided with them uh, to them the uh, results of the findings on the plan review. And so uh, for the meeting. Uh, in the site visit, we had them present as well. It was, um, I tell you, it was uh, it was it was an eye-opening experience. Um, it uh, if not only for for us, but for the design professional, whom thought obviously when they considered documentation that it was it was fairly relatively complete, and there were some things that uh, that uh, were uncovered uh, that were very beneficial from an ed educational standpoint. Uh, for for them, um, the, that that was done, uh, and it was uh, it was extremely beneficial. Next, um, I guess one one of the things uh, that that I'd like to talk about is just some of the some of the difficulties and challenges that face the code enforcement community with respect to um, energy compliance. Plan review. Uh, the 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 design professional community uh, has, um, there's great variable with respect to the quality of documentation that you're going to receive as a code enforcement office uh, from the design professional community. 
Um, the you know in in a in a perfect world you get a fully complete set of documents that span all the disciplines: mechanical, electrical, structural, civil. Um, and uh, in in many cases you do that, but it's typically reserved for the big box national developers that are building these these buildings that go from community to community, and they have prototypes. And those are the documents that are typically the most complete. Once you get to more kind of regional development or uh, development that's that's a, a one-time uh, uh, in in a town from a, from a a local uh, developer, and then the documentation uh, begins to get a little bit more um, thin. And uh, we are in the process right now of, of uh, developing a process where we can uh, both at, get the education out to the design professionals, um, respond to the 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 ongoing uh, demands in the building code and in the energy code with respect to uh, quality documentation. Uh, and uh, so, so that's that's kind of one of the one of the things that kind of spawned out of this. And the, we have to report uh, annually to the New York State Department of State that every code enforcement office uh, in the state needs to to do a an end of the year summary um, of a reporting of the code enforcement activity. And the years, uh, this 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 reporting on energy uh, related matters specifically has grown exponentially as far as what we need to communicate that we received uh, from uh, out of the documents and getting into a greater 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 level of specificity. And um, you know, so that's one of the things that uh, you know that we're 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 looking to really concentrate on. Uh, certainly, this process. Uh, is 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 uh, revealed some of the deficiencies that not only are present in the code enforcement community but also uh, in the design professional community. So um, that kind of uh, is kind of uh, you know how 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 that is played out. Um, next, please. So the project, uh, you know, again we we historically been been. The leftover vehicles from the police department. Um, usually, you know, around Victoria's that have had 120 to 150 thousand miles on them. You know, they're not very fuel efficient, um, and uh, that is historically how we've been um, uh, managing our, our fleet. Uh, we are looking at uh, purchasing uh, three uh, high Chevy Volt high, hybrid. Uh, we intend on on, on retiring 50% uh, of our, our fleet vehicles with these. Again, I mentioned earlier we we do have uh, our home base threading stations uh, ready to be utilized. Uh, so we're very excited about it. We are very very close to finalizing things um, with Nicerta and, uh, and 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 we're just at the point where we're looking to stake contract right now to see uh, when when we can place these orders and, and get these vehicles in to start using them. So I thank you all for listening to what we have to say, and um, that's all. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mark. I uh, was lucky to have heard that story when you shared it with us, uh, I think, last year, but it's great that we got it out to the, to the wider community. Thanks so much. You're welcome. Thank you. Uh, so, Lindsay, I'm going to pass the controls to you now. Looks like you are unmuted, right? I'm here. I am. And go. And hand back to me when you're all done. Okay, now? Uh, a sec. Just a reminder, this is uh, Lindsay Auden with the village of, of uh, Croton on Hudson. Is that right? One second. One second. I'll push some more buttons here. Sure. Instead, we push this button. And I think we have to move this uh, off screen. Hold on. There we go. Okay. Welcome, everyone, to um, Croton, New York, a small town, um, about 8,000 people on the Hudson Valley. And you may know us as the site of the uh, Hudson Valley Quarter Festival. Um, 
we are merely a bedroom community, but we also do a lot of um, uh, attraction type stuff. What is our town hall seeing right now? What I'm about in uh, our uh, process is we can um, turn this uh, facility into what I call a living LED lighting lab in our Croton Town Hall. I chair the uh, Croton Sustainability Committee, and um, we have um, uh, successful in uh, a number of projects. One of which is we want to convert the light in the town hall to LED. Now, so we took very seriously the uh, request that any project we do should be replicable, should be something that will educate others. So we built in a characteristic that I think you'll find interesting. Now, we know that um, when we want to cut carbon, LED lighting is a great way to go. You can convert uh, indoor lighting from fluorescence to LEDs, and you'll save energy, you'll cut utility bills, you'll reduce your maintenance costs, and especially, you'll reduce your carbon footprint. But sometimes, choosing the best LED option can be a daunting task. To replace the fluorescent lamps with tubular LEDs, what we call T-LED or T-LED lamps. Well, okay, which variety? You see at least nine or ten different varieties. There are now even more. Well, okay, how do we uh, uh, separate these out? There are at least three different technologies with two more variations and hybrids on those technologies just within these direct replacement lamps. Or go to LED retrofit kits. These are very nice. These kits will pop right into your existing fixture. They'll leave it like a new fixture. They have uh, the LEDs already in them. But will they fit? How much do they weigh? What do they cost, etc.? If you've got the money, the best way to go, of course, is to buy new fixtures with tin LEDs. Just replace your fixtures completely. In the real world of municipal spending, that's out of our uh, league. So we said, gee, what can we do in the world of retrofit? How can we help others see how to do this? To do this, we're going to create what we call a living LED lighting lab. So there's municipal personnel and others choose among these many LED options. To do so, we're going to alter lights on the second floor corridor and stairwells of our municipal building. You're on the floor plan. We have a real long corridor and two stairwells. This is on our second floor. In the process, we're going to show many different LED options, and that area will be open for public viewing during regular business hours for one year. So anybody from another municipality or you know somebody else who wants to look at LED lighting and how they all look different from each other, can come and take a look at this. Here's what that corridor looks like. It's a nice, long, straight corridor. We're going to turn in it nine LE retro options, one each of the nine fixtures. They bind up so the viewer can see how they differ visually. A cone flyer that will compare each on various criteria, such as what it cost us to buy them, what it cost us to install them, whether it was hard or difficult, what's the angle. Don't ask about that now. That's a technical issue. The light output. And free copies of that will be available at the village manager's office, which, as you see in the picture with the arrow, is right along the corridor. In um, uh, stairwells, we're all new fixtures, because that's about as many as we can afford. There's like nine of them. And um, they will be bi-level fixtures with built-in motion sensors. These types of fixtures um, are able to reduce, not turn off, but reduce their light output to a safe level, uh, about one-third or one-half the maximum while there is no occupancy in the stairwell. That saves a lot of money because stairwells are oftentimes lit 24-7. Then if any motion sensed anywhere near the base or top of the well, the lights come bingo all the way back up to full and stay there until somebody has left the stairwell plus a few extra minutes. We're going to show in several rooms uh, some new wireless or switch-mounted occupancy sensors. Those would turn lights off either ones of the room or the whole room uh, when there is no occupancy. The wireless option is uh, something that's been out for a few years. Some of you may have heard uh, the technique called the N-Ocean. That's the company that makes them. This is a wireless devices that um, will actually be recharged by the lighting from either windows or the light fixtures themselves, so that you do not have to connect any power wiring to them. They work via uh, a Wi-Fi or a Zigbee or some other type of communication between the wireless sensor mounted in the room and uh, the uh, uh, relays that would go where the switches normally would be. One of the good parts about this is you can re relocate these devices as you fit, depending upon how you change the uh, characteristics of the room. You put up new uh, barriers, new um, uh, uh, separations or whatever, and you may have to move a, a sensor in order to see people, so to speak. The wireless one makes you be able to do that without any extra cost. Now, what about the other lights in the rest of the building? Well, 
have approximately uh, 340 fixtures there or thereabouts. And um, we are going to have the uh, Croton Department of Public Works people look at different options that we install in the hallway, pick which ones make sense. Some of them may be retrofit kits, some might be um, uh, just uh, uh, LED lamps, whatever. Because this building, which was in 1909 as a K-12 school, the lighting was previously repurposed back in 1939. And uh, the building was repurposed in 1939, and then only in the 1990s was that uh, old lighting re replaced or upgraded with lamps and electronic ballasts. Now we're bringing the building into the 21st century by using LED lighting, which has the following nice characteristics. I'm going to cut $1,000 off our utility bills, save 64,000 kilowatt hours a year, eliminate 16.4 tons of carbon, and in the process also take 16 kilowatts of load off the grid. Lower the building's cooling load, because you know when you reduce the amount of heat coming out of the light fixtures, it reduces the cooling load. And also, because the LEDs have a nice long life, relamping for 15 to 20 years. Significant reduction in maintenance. And of course, we get rid of the lamps, which contain mercury, etc. So there are numerous synergisms in this uh, by being able to um, uh, make that kind of replacement. Uh, this also fits very well with what um, we do in uh, Croton, uh, how to make sustainability happen. This is the um, uh, waterfalls in our area. We are part of the watershed of New York City. So whenever you're in New York City and you take a drink, think 5% us, because that's about where 5% of the um, uh, water comes through is our watershed area. We're in our area for the scenic rivers, waterfronts, parks, and we work very hard uh, to maintain that sustainable community. And we see this LED project as just another step in that process. And we thank very much uh, NYSERDA's funding, $50,000, and support in helping us make this happen. That's my story. Thank you much. Shall I come back to you? Uh, that would be great, Lindsay. Thanks. One second. Let's see. Sorry. There we are. Back to you. Um, very good. Uh, I don't see that back, but that's all right. Um, so we do have some questions uh, here that have come in. Um, one that came in, uh, Jim, can you hear me? Let's see. Jim is muted. I just took you off mute, Jim. Uh, Catherine Hurlman is asking uh, uh, calculator for greenhouse gas. Uh, reduction be um, ascribed to organics recycling. Oh, Jim. Yeah. Uh, so let, let me, if I can, I think I missed half the question. Or, or the question is asking about greenhouse gas calculations for organics recycling. Yeah, calculator. There are a number of different calculators um, available uh, that we can send her link to. Um, the EA Warm model. Um, which may not be up to date, is a decent calculator. It provides a life cycle estimate of, of uh, that, that when you send something to a landfill and can compare it to, to aerobic composting, which doesn't create greenhouse gas emissions. So there are calculators such that one available to make those estimates. Right. right. Okay. Uh, I have some other questions here, thanks to our intrepid team in all the Okay, could go either out to our community uh, panelists or to Jim. How do you identify municipal projects uh, that will have the most impact? Bang to the buck. Jim, you want to kick us off with that? Yeah, I think that you know the first way to to understand what projects are going to have the biggest bang for your buck is to understand you know where your emissions are coming from in your operation. And uh, you don't have to do a full greenhouse gas inventory for that, but, but a couple of, you know, uh, I guess rules of thumb. And if you, you know, if you have water operations, wastewater treatment or water filtration or pumping, um, it's going to be your biggest energy consumer by far, typically. So if you can develop, you know, options in there, variable speed drives or um, the, the options like Mayor Martin and just spoke about, those are going to be very, very big uh, bang for your buck. Uh, other things, like if you are, you know, for example, if you are a town 
and you have, you know, and you're fairly rural, you're going to have a, a high amount of your emissions in your uh, transportation sector because of the rules that you have to manage. So electric vehicles are going to be a, a good bang for your buck um, in, that, in, in that scenario. But, you know, in general, all of the options we discussed here um, are going to be reason, or are going to provide pretty good benefits um, for greenhouse gases. Thanks, Jim. Any want to want to weigh in on that? I could take you off uh, mute, Mark, for Greg. I will. <laughs> mute. All right. Now you're both able. Um, all right. Well, I have a question. Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead, Greg. Well, it's good. It's just. You know, we looked at the existing system and, and realized that we were in a failure mode, and we know the importance of the wastewater treatment plant, obviously. And for it was uh, it was a way to get the process started. We were encouraged by Anka and Jim, of course, but realized that this had to be done sooner than later. And uh, to you know got kind of an engineering firm to develop the you know the initial phase of this and this was to move forward i mean we need to get this in these two blowers replaced as soon as possible and i think there's in between now if we get the bids out and get everything on track i i hope to get these things replaced no later than the september or the first of october of this year i mean this is borrowed time and we have we have some special issues dealing with the wastewater system, I and I, and a couple other things that we are investigating and working. On. Uh, I encourage people to, you know, to use these resources and to you know, realize that I'm that sometimes, you know, I, I go wastewater plant and I wonder why I waited so long. But I would much rather be able to pay for these things up without having to bond issues and go ahead and, you know, borrow money over a period of years. Um, it works well, and I think we're going to be okay. Mm -hmm. Great. All right. Well, yeah, the next question I had here was about budget constraints. So, you know, the challenges of actually implementing a project around budget constraints. You've talked to that to, to some degree. You want to add anything else about, you know, who's a big sticker, big chicken there? Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. How did you, you know, uh, effectively sell it to the board, which had well, the work? We effectively narrowed it down. We uh, knew approximately what the cost was going to be because of the prior bid that we had received and not it on about six years ago or so, maybe longer. And plan the, the village board, which has maintained the same members over this time, we set a plan that we were going to some side in a capital reserve that, that we could, you know, off the cost. Uh, we, we figured that we could run with one more motor for a period of time and then you know, get the process moving forward as quickly as possible. The board was on, the board has been very effective and they've been very helpful and they've been very supportive of this whole idea. And, you know, we we just needed a major water project up here that hope in fires, uh, some economic growth in this northern tier. And we can offer wastewater services, water services, as well as natural gas services is along a corridor, uh, basic just across from Quebec, which is a huge, huge uh, it's on our economic situation here in northern New York. I would advise that you know people put side as they can. Uh, how long can you wait? And right now, uh, we are at the end of our effective rope here, so to speak, and it's going to happen this, this summer is it replaced. So it's, it's tough you know, with the restraints that we are facing, the mandates that we're facing. Yeah. But we can do it. I think everyone out there can do it as well. Right. You alluded to the fact that uh, the village of uh, Croton is not independently wealthy. How did you, um, how did you 
work with the constraints? We looked at the um, way in which the uh, financial issue was set up uh, for this grant, and we saw that there was uh, no requirement for a, um, a matching uh, output from the village. And so part of our idea was to uh, look at what project we could do that could be essentially 100% funded by the grant. And that way the village board said, oh, we don't have to put any money out, go for it. I see. Excellent. Yeah. Terrific. Um, this is a Jim Younger question or two here. Uh, one requirement of these projects uh, is that they need to be replicable, Jim, right? So uh, where can communities find information about completed projects other than this webinar? Good question. Uh, the first, uh, I guess my first response is, is that would like to see projects that are replicable. It is one of the criteria they look at. It isn't absolutely required. So if you have a project that, that, that wouldn't be replicable, it doesn't necessarily mean it would not pass. But um, and then so on your second question, in fact, we're going to the clean energy community coordinator team. We're 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 trying to figure out right now. We have a whole base of projects that have been submitted to the communities, and we're going to try to figure out how to produce a profile of them for distribution to communities um, based on what's been submitted. And, and some have been submitted, some haven't been approved yet, and so we can't put everything out there. But working, we'll work with NYSER to figure out how to get you a list. Uh, uh, Perspective communities a list of projects that have been submitted. So we're working on it. Hopefully that that helps. And, and communities can certainly contact their coordinator or me, um, and I can give you a lot more details of projects if you just contact me. Okay. Uh, just had a bunch more questions come in. So speaking of budgetary constraints, are municipalities allowed to use the grant money to directly purchase construction materials such as insulation and um, can they use the time of the appropriately trained DPW staff? I guess, can they use grants toward for appropriately uh, trained DPW staff to do energy efficiency updates without an external contractor? Over to you, Jim. Yeah, I, I, my answer would be yes, you can procure any sort of equipment or supplies that are directly related to energy savings. So insulation would be would be viable. And also in the case of designing your budget, there is no restriction against you spending the resources on your own staff, again, as long as they're qualified uh, to do it. Most communities use their own staff as an income match, but it, it is feasible to put a direct line item in your budget for that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Kathy, couple more. I think they're all headed your way. Can, uh, could EV projects of uh, incentives include vehicles beyond fleets, such as garbage trucks, street sweepers, mass transit vehicles? Uh, so you don't have to just be limited to, um, uh, you know, passenger sedans. So any sort of, yeah, large, like a transit vehicle or garbage truck, if you can find um, electric options in those categories, you can definitely... Uh, uh, divert your funding to. I think we ha we've had communities interested in transit vans um, for you know circulating in, in, in urban areas. Yes, if they're if you can find options, they are they are viable. Okay. Uh, question about benchmarking. Yeah, this is a um, one that a lot of people wonder about. How much time does it really take to use portfolio manager to keep um, updated? on county-owned buildings. So the writer has well over three quarters of a million square feet of built space that they would be entering. The question is how, how long, what is the time commitment to, to, to no. keep portfolio manager updated? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A very hard question to answer, but it really depends on the technical expertise of the staff in charge of managing it. But portfolio manager is designed, there's an upfront investment to get it all set up. But um, once you have it in place, uh, it, depending on how frequently you update your bills, um, it, I, it's hard for me to say, but it's probably a couple hours or, of time commitment a month to upload bill at that level. It could be more or less depending on how you set it up. So it's, it's not insignificant, but it's not you know, days 
pieces of work either. So I would give you more clarity, but I I don't know. Case. Right. Now, this next one may require use of your crystal ball, Jim. Um, are the funds projected? Are are these grant funds projected to be renewed again in 2019 or before? Late, we're not nicer to staff, and uh, we we speak of the program that's on the street, and uh, so unfortunately, I don't have a crystal ball to see what nice service plans are. We all hope that uh, if this project is successful, they'll, uh, this program is successful, they'll want to continue it. But that's all I know. Yeah. Right. And uh, uh, multiple projects. The community put, put you know, forth like a menu of multiple projects. That's a very good question. We've had communities break up their grants, uh, their hundred thousand dollar grants, into as much as four projects. Mm -hmm. So, I it, it is definitely feasible to do it as long as the project is easy to manage and the money is very just pushed into different projects. It's possible. I think you know the. the I don't speak for NYSERDA. I just think it's a matter of just make sure that the project is easy to manage that there are components and you know exactly where the funding is going and if you can do that clearly like for example you want to spend thirty dollars on an electric vehicle it's a very clear and simple process and then you want to spend some another clear and simple process then uh, it's doable there's no restrictions against you breaking a project right? just to make it logical and easy to manage right I think that concludes the questions we've received today. I really appreciate such audience participation. Um, so thank you all very much. The slides uh, and the recording will be sent to everyone who uh, registered for that, and then posted on the uh, Capital uh, uh, District Region Planning Commission website and on the CourtneyStrong.com website as well. So thank you all for coming uh, to today's call, and we look forward to hearing from you and working with you uh, in the future. Thank you.